Hello and welcome to the alternative host for the DMs Book Club. That's right. Fiona's given me the keys to the car and we're going to just go for a <laughs> joy ride and see what happens. My name is Ryan. I've got Fiona here, as usual. Hello. And I'm talking because Fiona's the one that's picked the topic this mm-hmm. week, which is exciting. How are you? Are you doing okay? I'm doing really well, Ryan. Just, you know, ticking along. As you know me, I have various projects on the go and this is one of them. So actually, it was quite nice to to tick it off my list on Sunday going, yes, I've read. <laughs> I've are read you, it all. <laughs> are you the sort of person that puts update your list on a list? Like, Ooh. if you go that far... Oh, maybe not. I, I do that thing where I have 12 things to do each day, which I know 12 sounds like a lot, but it's because I have a... Oh my God, this is so boring. Uh, you have a, <laughs> I have a ruled notebook that has 12 spaces, so I fill it out. But it'll be stuff like emails at the top, and then usually it's the fun thing in the evenings so of recording D&D, recording this podcast, etc. And then in between, I have to fill it up. But sometimes I won't have enough to fill, so it'll be stuff like clean teeth. <laughs> <laughs> shower shower's been a big one i was gonna say i don't think i know of a day in which i've done 12 productive things that seems like a lot of work no no it's this little things it's it's a little bit mixture of little things and sort of normal ticking things but sometimes i do have to instead of like i don't cross things out i do an arrow which moves them to the next day the next list (laughs) i I never cross out (laughs) because yeah that's fair yeah i've been good yeah it's i have to say i always enjoy the time that sort of goes into reading through these little chapters and getting a little distracted because the real working world is much more boring than the stuff that we get to talk about now, Um, which I think we should probably just jump into because I have a real pressing question for you, Fiona. (laughs) Okay. And that is, when we decided to do this club, you gave me the first choice and I I thought, you know, it'll be really interesting. We'll go for giants, something a little bit like, you know, a large topic, but but something that can be used in different ways. You went straight for mind flayers. Yes. Now, <laughs> would you like to discuss as to why mind flayers drew your attention? So, uh, obviously, I, uh, it's a shock to no one if you've listened to any content I've ever created, but I'm a bit of a nerd. Um, but actually, I wasn't... I, I, I wasn't a big fantasy person when I was growing up. I was more of a sci-fi person and a horror person. Like I, I remember like reading stuff like uh, like Dracula, Bram Stoker's Dracula, and then moving on to Twilight, going, "Hang on, that, that's not what I want." And you know, reading Frankenstein, all this sort of thing. And I, I was the biggest sort of influence I had growing up was Doctor Who. Mm. And in Doctor Who, obviously, you have all these amazing different aliens and and creatures and stuff, and when I saw the Ood, which I'm sure I will talk about later, I was like, "These, there's something about it. I was like, this is really weird. I'm sure I've seen these creatures before, heard about them before. And slowly but surely through various other sci-fi, sci-fi fiction shows and general sort of reading, obviously came to sort of uh, Call of Cthulhu and Lovecraft stuff. Now, obviously, I have, everyone has to do this thing whenever they talk about a Call of Cthulhu. Lovecraft was an awful person. We don't have to talk about that guy. <laughs> his, work's all, his work is all right, but, you know, and it's spawned other worlds and stuff, but he's an awful person. That's fine. But that, so I just thought they were just an interesting concept. And then coming to D&D and suddenly finding there was a very similar kind of creature but in a fantasy setting and so well adapted for a fantasy setting. It just kind of, not blew my mind, but instantly everything just clicked for me. I thought, yes, these, these are the creatures for me. <laughs> yeah, because Mind Flayers, you're right, they have been around in, in sort of at least in the D&D setting for as long as I can remember, like as, as many editions back as I've looked at them, they've always been fairly staple. Mm-hmm. And I think it's because they're really good, like villains of the piece. They represent a lot of what's bad, and evil and a little bit weird and creepy i think like there's they're not right i mean you were talking about the ood and i'm afraid um, my doctor who knowledge is never as as good as 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 it should be because i don't really watch much because i think it's a bit rubbish controversial opinion but that's a different podcast (laughs) the bood the bood the ood (laughs) the bood are very different the ood i do remember a little bit because they came across as if not good than at least sort of quite neutral mm-hmm. and mind flayers are anything but mm-hmm. and that's what is, is so interesting about your choice of them i mean tell me a little bit about them obviously we're looking at the um the volo's guide mm-hmm. which is a additional book as given to us by wizards of the coast the dmd it's very good actually it's the same book that we used for giants and there's a good 
11 pages on mind flares. So yeah. do you want to give me a bit of a summary as to what people can expect if they read it? Yes, absolutely. So um, essentially, uh, the I always called them the Ood then. I've got, them, I've got Ood on the brain. It's the same thing. It's it fine. is the same thing. Well, not exactly, but okay. So mind flares or their sort of normal race name or whatever it is, Illithids. This is going to be another point, by the way. I'm, I'm sure it's going to be a theme throughout all these podcasts where I cannot pronounce things, but I think it's Illithids. That's the Illithid. legend. Yeah, that's yeah. how I would say it, yeah. Right. Hooray. Um, <laughs> so Illithids are, they are essentially a parasitic race, which uh, is from a different plane of existence, hence the sci-fi elements in it. And in the, the Forgotten Realms version of them, they are, were quite a domineering race and had slaves called, uh, which a slave race called the, Gifra- the Gif, who then through various means did a revolt. And as a result, within a year, the whole uh, Mind Flayer sort of uh, race collapsed. And now they sort of live on the fringes of space and time and then infiltrate other planes to then try and take over those planes. Essentially, they have sort of three main goals, which is one is to get rid of the GIF because they are their worst enemy um, through this sort of overthrowing stuff. And then two is to sort of rebuild the glorious empire that through their grand design. And three is to assimilate all other humanoids into the Mind Flayer race. Um, you know, a free three point plan. You got you got to love a three point plan. Um, you can put it on a PowerPoint presentation. Pretty <laughs> it's quickly, just one I slide. Think. Yeah, <laughs> I, I would love that. Profit. Yeah. Profit. Hey. Um, so yeah. So they they're interesting in a way because obviously they have this ability to plane our travel or at least infiltrate other planes without necessarily having to go on oh, now i can't remember the the name of it but there's a certain city in the forgotten realms where you have to go to open the gate and go oh, to different it's languages. like sigil sigil Digil. Like that, isn't it? there yeah. you go yeah so they don't have to do that which obviously is a very big benefit for them uh the other thing really to notice about them is that they are a hive mind of consciousness uh if you meet a mind flayer the likelihood is that they're connected to a network of other mind flayers, which is the central hub of it is what's known as the elder brain, which is sort of their sort of concentration. So if you think, again, going back to sci-fi, thinking of like a Borg cube, it is the sort of the central uh, CPU, essentially, that sort of uh, interacts with the world throughout their little sort of... Uh, in the book, it calls them digits, like because obviously a mind flayer is just like an extension of the elder brain so using that sort of thing to sense out and collect information and then feed it back as a collective consciousness um and ultimately they they it's interesting because like you said they are villains but they are incredibly smart scientific villains they are i i I see them as like superhuman sort of scientists which are very very like us but cold and clinical so they don't have that emotional uh, sympathy or empathy with them and they rub but they're very weak as well so they will actually defeat their enemies through cur- covert means so they'll ha- stay hidden they'll be waiting for their moment and then sort of use subterfuge and sort of manipulation through the humanoid races around them and then assimilate over time so they're they're in it for the long haul essentially Mm -hmm. I think what I love about them, and I've always liked an intelligent villain, because you can do so much more with them, but they are intelligent. And that's what's so diabolically fun about them, I think, because they are, they are little sort of infiltrators, they've got their fingers into all the shadows of all of the areas, and they, they're always around the corner, but never seen. That's what's quite interesting about them. And, and you mentioned on it before, the, the, the reproduction they have, which is pretty much to steal and then change people with, with parasites. There's, there, there are these pictures of these little, little horrible slug-like wormy things, mm-hmm. and they go into ears and noses and eyes and all kinds of horrible places and ugh, just... Those are the pictures they get me. I can look at all the pictures in the book of like dissections and be like, yeah, that's fine. But anything crawling into like an eye, mm-hmm. oh, that's yeah, weird for me. Not a fan. Yeah, this is, <laughs> what's it called? It's a ceramorphosis. And interestingly, the so in case anyone, ha- well, people will read it, but it takes a week or so for this creature to sort of go in, eat 
the humanoid's brain and then sort of attach itself to the brainstem and then the process of becoming a mind player happens to that humanoid. There's a, a game that's going to be coming out, I think, this year or next called Baldur's Gate 3. And in the trailer, there is a moment where the human adventurer sort of stops and it literally transforms into a mind flayer, but within seconds. And that for me is frightening. Like having the two extremes, you have either like this ongoing suffering where you just just die over a slow, long period and change into this thing. Well, not even die, because that's the other thing as well. You just have your brain eaten, just the, you know, like an intermediate step. You, you become, <laughs> but you become, but that's the thing, you become the mind flayer and you sometimes only retain very former memories of that previous life but they don't matter to you anymore you are obviously a completely different person even though I you thought I thought that was really interesting mm. that once you become a mind flayer they they remember bits of the who they were but it doesn't matter like normally villains that are changed whenever you've got sort of people that metamorphosize or become you know changed in, in, in a forceful and evil process if they remember bits of themselves that's the process in which normally the hero will like oh remember who you were remember your love of blah 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 like cheese and suddenly <laughs> they will have this huge redemption arc that gets them through but in this case it's not like that at all mm-hmm. that the memory is a totally incidental mm-hmm. I, I think that was a really nice touch actually just the sort of yeah little yeah. little treats that will get brought along but really don't change much but and and that's interesting as well because obviously yeah you, like you said you have the scenes where the adventurer goes no think of your wife she's still alive or you think of think of your child etc trying to use that sort of uh, guilt tripping sort of that leverage yeah. but obviously that doesn't work for a mind player so almost like if you had a situation like that it could feed back onto the players going like your friend has gone and has been gone for some time and that in a storytelling game where you are playing it's 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 frightening actually like you don't yeah. know and similarly onto that they do this other thing with because so not everyone becomes a mind flayer they there's a thing they have called thralls where essentially it's great there's a oh sorry i'm getting ahead of myself but there is a great <laughs> heading in this book called the importance of brains which i'm just like oh that's such a great cookbook idea like, <laughs> just, or a philosophy but obviously it goes into detail about how uh, certain underdark races because of course they um mind flayer colonies will be underground and so will be in the underdark most likely to get yeah. away from stuff they say well these people these certain uh underdark races brains they taste okay but these ones don't and etc so some of them will actually be used and transformed into what we call thralls, uh, using them as sort of manipulate them as sort of uh, minions or, or spies to go out and feed back information. And they're usually a bit more heartier, almost like uh, guard dogs, essentially. And mm. what I quite liked, again, there's an, a great image in uh, in the book talking about how the, what, what the process is for becoming a thrall was that you uh, you make the humanoid sort of a uh, docile through silent energy almost like acid on the synapse and again you just become a partial shell of yourself brainwashed and you you retain your basic stuff you know your basic stuff and you act like that person but you you are completely loyal to the elder brain to the, the to the mind flayers commonly and it takes to get that person reformed takes a lot a long time so you can just imagine these almost sleep sleeper agents in these sort of things and it reminded me because again you know have to have to drop in tba mondays when <laughs> when we were uh, the party was in sort of the underdark for a bit there was a moment where we we met some duragar and we had to sort of go to a temple to go for the sort of the first seal and there was mentioned that well we could you know we have to pass the sort of this colony this empire and there was i think maybe one or two mentions that oh maybe mind flayers down there and at the time i was like no one was, n- none of the other two the other two players didn't really say anything about it but i was like that's that's not good that's not good for, <laughs> on so many levels um but obviously i obviously I, as all of our players have never encountered mind flayers because they are so rare and i think mm. that's the interesting thing to me is that if you are going to use mind flayers or or have something similar in your campaign compared to giants which makes sense like they're sort of out in the open maybe they are rarer but everyone still knows about them mind flayers no one's really encountered them uh because they've they're so well hidden and yeah. they they know ways to sort of infiltrate societies and just always have them there so there's a lot of there's a lot of storytelling you've got to do to sort of put them 
mm. in the place of wherever they are. You've got to think, okay, there's a, there's a hive of them in this location. How will it affect everything around? What have they done to keep themselves secret? You're right. Yeah. It, it, it's, they are, you've got to think about them a little bit. I, I, and it's, I think it's, it's sort of indicative of any creature that gives itself. I think most of these mind flowers have at least like 19 intelligence, which is pretty super clever. Mm-hmm. And, and obviously the brains and, and the, uh, the more clever ones are higher than that. And that's, yeah, that's the way they are. They're just so clever and mm-hmm. so cunning. And I would say probably like a little bit like, like psychopathy, maybe just like mm-hmm. a little bit like, yeah, there's a sort of sense of evil to them and, and patience. That was the other thing. They're willing to sit and do very little for a long time mm-hmm. and just wait it out. It's a, uh, yeah, horrifying. Absolutely horrifying. I prefer giants. You can see giants. <laughs> giants are, are much more obvious. I mean, when, when you're going through it, was there anything, you, you, you've obviously mentioned a lot so far, but was there anything that really jumped out at you as like, this is cool? This is the thing. So obviously, I would just say mind flayers are cool anyway. But I, I think <laughs> that there's definitely the. I think what's interesting because I didn't really know much about, and I say this, you know, with, with, like sort of uh, quotation marks, but like mind flayer culture, because obviously it is all so you know brain orientated. But the idea of uh, like so they're called again, I can't pronounce it, but funer- funerary brain jars. So mm. essentially, in mind flayer culture when a mind flayer uh, is grievously injured or becomes a senile or in, is incapacitated in some way, they are fed to the elder brain. Uh, the special, uh, and they just, and then collective memories are kept. You know, so it's, everything's in the hive mind still. But certain, <laughs> I, basically, I like to think of it as a, a brain jar is essentially like a daily or a, a yearly blog um, <laughs> where they, they all have one and they sort of update their achievements and what they've done using their language, which is the other cool thing, which I'll go on to. And so they'll update it and keep it with them to remind them, remind themselves and other mind flayers that th- this is what this mind flayer has achieved. And then, you, you know, they'll, the brain will be kept in there possibly if it's a really exceptional brain, but otherwise it will just get fed back into the elder brain. So just imagining coming across, like, say there was uh, in your campaign, you had there had been a mind flayer colony, and it had been decimated, or they'd moved, or something like that, and they just left some jars behind, and just finding these things and going, "What do you mm. think? What do you think would have contained this? What's all?" <laughs> and so I just. It, it did. That, that, that's something I thought. That's pretty cool because it again reminds me a lot of. I used to be a massive fan when I was a kid. Oh god, this brings it back of Egyptian. Like I used to be really big on the pyramids and the sort of all life after death stuff. Mummification. Oh, yeah. yeah, putting putting organs in jars. Like I was clearly quite a gothic kid at heart. Anyway. <laughs> but that sort of thing. But the other cool thing, which I really really like, is their writing. So uh, again, pronunciation not great, but I think it's qualif. Um, is the way they write so they yeah will that sounds have, good to me oh all right uh they'll have like um it's like four line stanzas uh written but it is imprinted like in perspective in, uh, very little not very noticeable on various objects mm. and it not only contains some of the words but also the feelings what the mind flayer is about who's writing it just a whole lot of like meaning and significance into these stanzas and, and just like anything good with a mind flare, you try and read it and fail to read it. You go utterly mad trying to comprehend it. I, exactly. Just a nice little mind flare touch. I like to think of it as like super braille. Do you know what I mean? Yes. Braille on steroids. You sort yeah. of put your, your little fleshy tentacle over it and like, whoa. But, but, yeah. then, but then at the end of it, it said, oh, but a comprehend languages spell would easily solve this. And you're like, no, no, it's it's beyond anything. And that that's, that's the thing. I... I feel like these creatures, because because again with Call of Cthulhu and and the, sort of the the way the old ones are portrayed, that when you see them or when you sort of uh, have this thing, they are so impossible to comprehend that you go mad or you you, you your brain can't contain it, mm. and that that's for me is the coolest thing about it, like seeing something that instantly you just can't can't understand it anything and it's, it's what, like what a do? nightmare like a, a lot of people i talk to you some people get nightmares where they're quite sort of 
physical or understandable things and nightmares like you're being chased by somebody trying to kill you or you're running away from something or you've lost something nightmares can often be like that but a lot of people I speak to myself included nightmares are more of a concept of there's something in your brain that's playing out and you just can't compute it like you'll you'll be trying to quantify some big thing into smaller things and it doesn't work or you'll be Mm. trying to put something into a box or making something make sense and a nightmare will just be that sense of hopelessness that you can't comprehend whatever it is that you're doing. A lot of people get that sort of nightmare. And that's, it's a very similar sort of concept, isn't it? You look at these things and half of the trouble is that you just you cannot understand it. It's, it's just functioning on a whole other level of being. Mm. And it's, yeah, it's, yeah, it's I, I do like the, the data bank approach, the, the, the sort of the, the brain banks that, and you were talking about we see the funeral jars and the funerary jars and, and all that sort of thing. It's, there's been a lot of sci-fi that has sort of popped up over the years about, you know, when humans get this concept of being able to download your personality into like oh, a computer yeah. and then Fiona 2.0 appears or oh. Ryan 2.0 appears when you die, <laughs> you know, being able to sort of replicate yourself or being able to download like your parents' memories and, and, and intelligence and then like your grandparents just when you're, 12 or whatever it is and just sort of becoming this sort of superhuman because of that it's very like that isn't it it's, it's sort of the D D equivalent of that they don't have a sense of like death or, or or afterlife because there isn't one it's just sort of continual uh, it's really interesting i think and that's actually that's really interesting i hadn't thought of that the idea that if you have because that's the thing, like you said, like so the collective consciousness is constantly their their main drive is that they want to know more. There's the you know the way to defeat the enemy is knowing all about them and like coming up with a plan and targeting their weaknesses, etc. So they're always learning or they're always trying to learn and find them. So they're very actually quite curious creatures. But that's quite interesting. Like if, for example, and so this is the other thing as well. So the elder brain is sort of the unique aspect in all sort of uh, mind flayer colonies because they'll have certain characteristics they have to be sort of arrogant and sort of powerful enough because obviously they're the ones in control and any sort of usurper or like even the 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 uh the birth of an illithid which is basically a very powerful mind flayer which will then eventually turn and leave the colony taking some of the uh, mind flayers with it to create a new colony and having that sort of that weird sort of ego and paranoia about constantly having to make sure it's not going to get attacked and stuff you actually plays quite well into the role playing stuff and i wonder actually if you are a mind flayer and you have all these uh viewpoints or these experiences but it's actually quite conflicting so like i can i can tell you now like my grandparents bless them they have some you know incredible experiences but some of their viewpoints i would not be happy to act on um but again See, that, that, that is really interesting you, you you've really hit on it like whenever you read through these things of, of, of sort of beings that have endless sentience and the ability to download and download and download and all this hive mind intelligence it never writes about the fact that actually what they could know may be wrong Mm. like there may be huge chunks of information in these in these hives and in these brains but it's just totally wrong Mm. i mean you what if they ate some random orc's brain who Mm. was of the genuine understanding and belief that a city didn't exist because he Mm. just it was an utter lie and so this this hive believes no there's no threat there We, we we've got all this information and then it's just totally wrong Mm, exactly it's amazing yeah and just just again because again it's it's about pursuing the truth but then when does you when does it ju- is its judgment absolute and usually you'd say well the elder brain yes what it stops at the elder brain but actually what if the elder brain is is wrong and stuff mm. like what, what for you would you say is like stood out for you as like the main thing for the mind flyers then would you say i just yeah it, it's strange it, it I, the thing i really really enjoy is is that sense of then they don't fear death creatures Mm. that don't fear death are interesting because half of it is because either they're stupid or bold or reckless or they don't understand death and they're just willing to like go reckless and and smash into things and that's fine but it's because a mind flare that dies will just get consumed back into the elder brain and will basically just get repeated effectively Mm. they don't fear death they fear the disconnect, the being, the dying whilst away from the hive, and then not being reabsorbed in, or, or the loss of the mind flare, or um, you know, the, and, and that sort of 
the selfishness of it, I find really, really interesting. They're so insular mm. and they're so, they put so much importance on themselves that it actually has become a bit of a problem for them because they, they move very slowly, very carefully and very inefficiently. Mm. I, I just, it, it's an interesting way of approaching it. And actually jumping on that, because obviously they then does talk about, well, obviously, you know, if you don't necessarily want to put a whole MyFlyer colony into your campaign and like really think about it, there are things of like rogue or lone mind flayers. Mm -hmm. And this is what's been interesting for me is because I think they are such a cool creature. And a lot of times when I play one shots, it's because that creature is really cool. What one shots are out there that you would encounter this creature that's i think that's the ones i quite like so stuff like the lost kenku which obviously you have played in and i've run at least four or five times now because <laughs> i love it so much so if you uh, spoilers for it if people haven't played it but it's it is incredibly it's interesting every time i've played it it's been different essentially your friend uh, corcoran jones is a kenku and has gone missing and the last time you you saw him or heard where he, his whereabouts were, were in a little mining town called Town of Weirding. And that's essentially it. And there's obviously little plot points that you can put in or you can make stuff up. But the sort of the big bad of it is, again, spoilers, is a mind flayer has taken over this town. Uh, a lone mind flayer who is very interested in learning how to become a lich and is uh, dissecting all these creatures or, or working on the town and manipulating the townsfolk to see if they contain any sort of information about prolonging its life. So there's actually a type of mind flare called the Alhoun mind flare as a result. And they're very interesting because, again, the, the, the mind flares have a very interesting relationship with magic because they feel that they are so intelligent and so smart that if normal humanoids can use arcane magic, well, that's that's nothing compared to what mind flayers can do <laughs> which again i was like that's really cool like they don't they don't care but also the real reason is probably along the lines of well it, the gif probably used it as well to you know rebel and, and 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 break free so they don't like it because of that and they've come up with another reason to sort of cover story because mm. they would never want to admit that they could be beaten or you know they were super <laughs> When you were going through this, what is there anything stood out that you didn't like? This is always an interesting one to dig into because it's obviously a very cool topic and an mm -hmm. inter, you know an interpretation of it. But is there anything that didn't fit in for you? Yeah, there's and is this uh, now? So you know, I said at the beginning that I really love sci-fi. <laughs> 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 so obviously, the it's like how do mind flayers get around from plane to plane if they don't necessarily have to go to sigil? or they don't really trust magic to do transportation, et cetera. Um, well, <laughs> they've got a ship, but the ships, are <laughs> but the ships are called nautiloids. And obviously I had to look this up because I was like, I'm sure that's just, uh, an <laughs> it's just a Pokemon or something like that. And it really is. Obviously there's a, there's a sea creature called a, uh, called a nautiloid, which is just the, the big curly sort of shell and the tentacles. And that's what their ships look like. And instantly I was like, ah, oh, that's a bit rubbish. Like I just, it's <laughs> to me, it's so silly because obviously, again, fan the fantasy setting. I think they fit so well into it that they're these sort of scientists, that they're from the unknown, and we don't know about the other planes. Or, or normal adventurers, adventurers will very unlikely make it to another plane. But don't worry, they've got these ships that look like massive sea creatures with <laughs> tentacles. And you like, think riding around with an enormous conch shell yeah. is too much for you? Yeah. Oh yeah, I, I was like, and I'm done. Like, I for me, I would have loved it just if they just didn't say how they got it. Because this is the other thing: if they'd got uh, a nautiloid ship, it's very rare because obviously most of them have been destroyed by the so the war with the GIF. But they can't remember how to make them. So you're mm. like, just say the ways of moving between planes has been lost, and they are all disconnect. And that's the like you were saying before, like being disconnected from other mind uh, uh, mind flare colonies is a bad thing and they want to yeah. sort of create it and I, I that i prefer i just yeah i'm just <laughs> i just thought the image was so silly in my head i was just like no i if if i was ever going to put these a colony into a, a long-running campaign i would just say you don't know how they got here the mystery almost works better doesn't yeah, it exactly yeah i would agree no I, it, it's a funny thing isn't it you, it's got to be believable and a lot of what happens in the astral plane is they've almost tried to go 
too Lovecraftian in the way that they're sort of visualizing it and, and explaining it. And yeah, I do know what you mean. It's um, it's difficult, isn't it? I mean, you're talking about what, what you would do if, if, if Mind Flayers were in a campaign of yours. I mean, mm. how would you how would you go about putting them in? I mean, if, if you were building a story, uh, an extended campaign, or just a sort of a, a longer running plot, mm. would you be tempted to put these mind flares in as like a side project? Like there is an area and, oh, there happens to be some mind flares in this dungeon and they are influencing, or would you try and put them as part of like, a, like an actual big bad, uh, a villain of the piece or... Mm. how far would you go i mean but what what sort of things would you think about i think that's something i've i've struggled with like when i first sort of read it and thought about it because for me as you as you know my uh physically and mentally i do not have the capacity to run long campaigns i can't even remember my own character's name at the best of times but i just i think if i was going to put a mind flayer colony or mind flayer law where there's definitely going to be an elder brain in it I think I'd have to. That would have to be the starting point. That that everything else has to be built around, and even then, just because from our own experiences with TBA Mondays and other campaigns, so like lore is great, and when when players find it or go search for it or they or they 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 get involved in it, that's great. So we could yeah. go for sessions as we've discovered with TBA Mondays, and not even scratch the surface, and that's cool. Like just sitting on this secret for like 10, 20, 30 sessions. And then suddenly there's just something that gives it away and all, it all sort of fits into place and, and comes around. So that, I think that would be really cool, but it would take a lot of planning and a lot of prepping on my part, I think. Yeah. Uh, mm. That's, so in a sense, do you think the intelligence is almost a, a difficulty in, in sort of putting them into a world? Is, is it harder to put mind flares in than a dragon, for instance, like a white dragon, evil, brutish, sits on treasure? Like a mind flare is more difficult, do you think? I think so, because again and again, I think it's more my failings as a DM rather than like the the mind flares themselves. Because like, I think that when if they're done correctly, and of course there's no way to do these things correctly, I think if they because the mind flares, if I had uh, inserted them into this campaign and built the whole world around it, they will have so much information about it. So if there suddenly there's groups of adventurers that are doing really well. Hmm. They would learn everything about it. They would probably uh, maybe brainwash one of the two sort of interests or sort of the party connections uh, to sort of infiltrate them further and use them as sort of leverage against them. Um, the, but the other thing, and this is where sort of my own sort of <laughs> octopus lizard brain comes into this. The, <laughs> So the elder brain stuff, obviously, like they, it tells you like how do you role play it and stuff like. That. And obviously, each elder brain is different, but they're you know they're arrogant, individualistic, you know, uh, like they sneer down on other humanoids. And obviously, in my head, that's like okay, so it's like almost like Jafar or or any sort of like a like Disney uh, villain is what I sort of my go to. I wondered if you could have it the opposite way around. So have like a really super upbeat positive mind flayer or positive elder brain almost like sort of brian blessed style so that when you do meet it you are completely flummoxed by how sort of nice it is but actually there's <laughs> super evil and it's just, just off-putting you know yeah i like that because they do describe them as curious which i thought was was an interesting one they're not um uh, they're, they're a bit genocidal and they're a bit evil but the curious is always quite a fun thing because it sort of it, it gives gives a good kidnapping a bit of a flavor doesn't it you, you've been stolen you're about to be turned into a mind flare but it might interrogate you for a couple of weeks just for the fun of it you know yeah, that mm. sort of evilness i like it i mean you, you mentioned before about being a bad dm or, or sort of looking at it that way and it's interesting isn't it because it's one of those monsters where perhaps you have a feeling where that might be you might feel like that but probably mind flares are easy enough to put in in different circumstances. I mean, we talk about the, the Lost Kenku is a great example of, of an exile, or some lone ranger who's doing something. Maybe it doesn't need to be an entire colony. Because the other thing as well, and this is probably my observation when I was mm. looking through this, is they're very high level. Mm. Um, you know, we're talking challenge ratings up to sort of 13, 14 for the, for the elder brain and anything. I mean, some of these mind flares have challenge ratings of sort of seven or eight. 
mechanically in D&D, that means that most parties can only ever handle maybe one or two of them at once. Yes. And if you've got a hive of maybe 50 or 60, it's very difficult to, to get that sort of difficulty into a campaign without breaking the system. And it's an interesting one. A party is trying to defeat a colony. How do you do that without fighting 30 of them at once? Mm-hmm. It's tricky, especially because they seem to have this high of intelligence where if you attack one, suddenly every single one within five miles knows because it gets broadcast immediately. Mm-hmm. So I think mechanically, it's really interesting. You have to think about thralls, slaves, mm-hmm. you know, not attacking it directly. And especially because this thing doesn't, I mean, one of the mentions it had is it doesn't have treasure. There's no, you know, these, yes. these things don't value gold or magical items or anything with wealth. It's all about knowledge. So your average adventure is not going to really find much in these colonies it has to be a real calling to, to sort of go in and uh, and destroy this thing and and the, actually the colonies the colonies itself are very difficult because the other thing we've not really mentioned is that mind flayers can levitate <laughs> so mm. they're all, all, the colonies themselves obviously they're like little burrows and warrens and stuff but it's all difficult terrain so the sort of humanoid thralls or, or to the guards as it were that brain been brainwashed they have to get around with ropes and stuff so actually infiltrating a mind flayer's colony if you choose to do that you have to do it stealthily and with an ability to somehow traverse difficult terrain at a pace and not fight 30 40 however many of these creatures are at the colony so it actually it's a very very difficult thing if your adventurers decide to go well we're going to have to put a stop to this because you like you said the, the the elder brain will know they're coming and so, yeah, yeah it's, it's a fascinating conundrum. And it's yeah. one I hope we never have to face in our campaign. <laughs> well, that's an interesting... Trying to convey to a party the sense of danger is often quite difficult to do anyway. Because it's <laughs> this balancing line between saying, hey, look, this is way more powerful than you. This is going to kill you if you try and, you know, tackle this head on. At the same time, balancing the you know, you can do what you want and I'm not going to stop you. I'm not going to railroad you. You have to sort of convey the sense of danger without feeling like you're saying, no, 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 you definitely, I'm not going to let you do that because mm-hmm. it's silly because that's not what the game's about. So no. yeah, you're right. It's, it's difficult. How do you convey the intelligence of the brain? Do you, do you have sightings? Do you have a, mm-hmm. a sort of reading gone wrong where the mind flares get sort of outed briefly and they see suddenly like nine or 10 of them mm-hmm. going around or do they see... I don't know, like, I don't even leave footprints, do they? I don't know how you'd convey. You'd have to probably think about some sort of uh, clever, clever way around. Well, you, like you said, like going back to sort of like having a rogue or lone mind flayer. So there are some who have to break away and pursue um, you know, magic, but some just just wish to break free. So you have, like again in the book, it talked about some of some people just having mind flayer advisors, which I can imagine just being an incredible sight to see because instantly you'd be like, well, that's a monster. We've got a monster advising the kingdom. And having to maybe role play that aspect of obviously being a creature who has broken away from essentially almost like it would have caused a civil war, probably, of being mm. trying to get away. And and obviously coming to another society where they're not accepted and stuff. And even then, there's again another line in it was saying that you know they have to be out of the the five mile radiance of the elder brain. But should it come under another elder brain or similar five mile radius it will revert back to its loyalty yeah. you're know, giving it and i thought oh that would be an yeah. interesting thing because as an ally Make, making it, yeah oh. the, the idea of a good one then being sort of changed is really interesting oh yeah you've got me thinking about an, an advisor that's that's a cool idea isn't it imagine if you had one next to a king or queen where every time you had a political prisoner or slave that would be executed Mm. The mind flare could absorb the brain and learn everything and then advise the king mm. of everything that thing knew. Like that's exactly. quite an interesting concept, really, isn't it? <laughs> well, and the, yeah, there's so much you can do with it. And that actually brings me on to this as so the next point I had was the way mind flares talk. So normally they, and again, this comes with the role playing. And I know, and again, I have to keep saying this obviously to myself, and I know you know this as well, when you role play, you don't have to do an accent and you don't have to put on stuff. No. What's cool about mind flares is obviously it's like whispers in the person's mind because they're doing it, they speak telepathically. And it talks about how uh, when, you, when you're sort of, when you're, you know, you're speaking, imagine sort of like the little clicks and whispers, like almost like mind static um, as you talk to these other creatures. Yeah. There's, 
the opposite thing they can do, which is super, super gross, where they can just pull out one of their tendrils or their tentacles, sorry, put it down their throat and act as a tongue in order to speak <laughs> common. And it says it's quite painful for the mind flow to do that, but also disquieting for everyone else around to watch it. <laughs> just no, like, that was that's horrendous so cool. when I read that. I just thought, <laughs> no, 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 no. There's oh. no need for that, especially if they need to cast magic, which of course has sort of verbal Double. components to that. And you sort of think mm, that could be another reason why they're not, not obsessed with it. Yeah. But it's interesting. Would you would you make clicking noises, static noises when you're sort of doing this? Or would you just describe it? Like what what's your what would be your go to? I think I because I I do try and do a voice if I can because I I quite in, I I am a performer. Uh, <laughs> so I but I feel like it's something that would really work on a recording. So like on on a stream or something like that. Because especially if you've got a microphone like here, you can probably do an proper ASMR like whisper. And then problems with clicks. I just sound like I, I'm I'm just erming, so like uh like that. <laughs> which isn't I don't think a mind player would do that. But again, it's I know it's that confidence about it, but I think the whispering um aspect of it is yeah. cool. Again, that's sort of yeah, like you, you you can yeah. do that. You get get very close, get very quiet, and sort of whisper into it. Yeah. A stuttering mind flare. So you got my thinking now. Like that <laughs> <laughs> oh no oh no well i mean there was there was a point really early on where i think again spoilers again but in in tv owners we we met a uh like basically it was a drug deal going down that didn't go well well for any of us but there was a mysterious creature that was at the back which used telepathy and again i was like my god has ryan just just f- thrown in a mind flare and we're only level three. <laughs> this is not, <laughs> this is not good. But it was again, a very cool moment where the, you know, we're surrounded by a group of people and there's just this voice that is in all of our heads and investigating and, and just probing and stuff like that. And I, again, it's that sort of thing where I, 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 I think I know what it was, but I ultimately don't. Cause it was one of those sort of like, here it is. And now it's disappeared and has, has escaped. And I was like, for sessions afterwards, I was convinced we'd see it again. And mm. we may we may do. But oh that 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 was definitely one of the, the best times I had when I was like, this could end super badly for all of us right now if it is <laughs> what I think it is. Do you think the fact that mind flares are so recognizable in that sense? I mean, not not saying either way whether that was actually a mind no, flare, because I'll not. leave that teasing to you. But <laughs> but the, the the mind flare being so recognizable do you think that's that's in a sense a bad thing because people might second guess what's happening or do you think it's good in the sense that you it, it throws a lot of like fear and panic that necessarily you wouldn't have managed to achieve otherwise i mean you can only get so scared about a pack of kobolds approaching it, you know it's it's mind flares are known horribly scary tough entities it's uh Mm. Is, is that a good thing do you think it's, i find this interesting and i think this goes for many creatures in D because as as we both know obviously we've played a lot of D. we've run a lot of D for each other and for other groups and stuff and i've got to that point now where i i recognize certain creatures or i recognize certain features of it but i don't know them well enough to be like oh the ac is this and they can do this this and this <laughs> so because some people do and that again i'm like you have so much time on your hands to know all this stuff and as soon as i know oh it's, it's ac is this or this other way, it sort of diminishes like it from being a scary creature to be like oh it is something i can hit as much mm. as possible and eventually it will go down that that is something i try and avoid actually you, 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 do. you don't want to give too much information you don't want to reveal something as a plus 12 or or whatever or, or like an ac15 yeah. because it gives it makes it seem like a number doesn't it rather than exactly rather yeah. than rather than a, a a monster but on the other side of it i know again uh, sort of uh, making fun of myself here but i'm a proper panto player so when i recognize something and i go no, it's not like that. Like, again, the other two, I think Sam, Sam is a little bit better at recognizing, but David sometimes, obviously, because he's, he's very new to the, to the D&D, he has no idea. And afterwards, he always says, I knew something was wrong because you both reacted really badly. And that's when we, I think, I think it was <laughs> the, the different levels of reaction. I think it was when, yeah. when we, we, we met the beholder or, or uh, it maybe wasn't a beholder, but it was it, obviously part of that thing. And we're on a bridge in the Underdark and david tries to talk to it and even i'm like i, I can't do anything because obviously i'm reacting in a certain way and i know i know that sometimes i'm like i shouldn't react 
in certain ways. But I know on the flip side of it, as a DM, if people do react and go, oh no, and panic a little bit, but are enjoying it, that gives me confidence to keep it going, yeah. yes, I've got them. And they're, they, they're, they yeah, know yeah, how serious it is now. Well, maybe that's the, the trick to mind flares then. You want them to be recognizable, but subtly so. Mm -hmm. Never give, ne never display them fully, just hints. Mm -hmm. suggestions just little just <laughs> make the party think they're fighting a mind flare but they've never actually ever had it confirmed that's exactly. that's quite an interesting way of looking at things definitely that's really really cool yeah wow that's a they got a whistle stop tour of mind flares <laughs> and uh everything i mean we've mentioned other things that use mind flares as, or, or maybe it's difficult to say which one leans on the other but everything these days are so connected yeah. and driven of years and years and years of high fantasy and sci-fi and horror, but you mentioned the Ood mm. um, as being a good example of, of like a take on the mind flares, exactly. although in that, in that case, less evil beings and more actually the thralls themselves in a mm. sort of funny old way. Mm -hmm. um, and then the, the hive mind with, with um, what did you say they were called in Star oh, the Trek? the Borg. The yes. Borg, that was it, and the cubes. That, for me, by the way, the Borg cube is the most ridiculous thing. You're talking about flying <laughs> conches and, and issues with mind flares. I've always had a problem with the Borg, but it's a flipping cube. It's, it's, it's simple. They, they, they're like, it's, it's, it'll do. It is, a, it is a cube. It doesn't need to be flashy. Like, I, I agree, but it probably isn't the most uh, aerodynamic thing through space, but it's, it, 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 they are a computer. <laughs> like, it's wrong. It's wrong. It's terribly <laughs> awful, and I've disliked it forever. I'm sure, I'm sure people could like, absolutely tell you exactly why. You're right, but there we go. There we go. So I, I will only judge you minimally for picking such an evil you know sort of manipulative intelligent super villain and i i very much look forward to running it or being run another adventure another lost kenku where you throw another mind flare at me i have to say you're talking about recognizing things i mean mm. i i recognized the mind flare up at the point where my character sat at dinner and the mind flare walks in but doesn't walk in you, you, it was a little slip of the tongue i don't know if you gave away more than you meant to mm. but you you hinted that it was floating so I, I made a check to see if i could check if it was floating and it was and my immediate thought was it's a wizard it's weird it floats <laughs> it's a mind flare it's 100 yeah. percent a mind flare and then about <laughs> half an hour later when i was rooting around its laboratory and you see things with like a little hole in the brain um yeah that's <laughs> absolutely horrible we, we, to be fair we, we haven't actually really gone about this at all the mind flayers eating brains doing it by effectively sort of drilling the front of somebody's head open that's mm. a whole other bit of the book you'll you'll Enjoy. love to see oh, yeah. just oh. in the stat block where it says it does this much damage and if you go to zero it eats your brain you think yeah oh lovely <laughs> anything that anything that you can't resurrect yourself from afterwards yeah. <laughs> uh, but, th but then just to quickly finish on that so the alhoon oh, no not the alhoon so the um the ulithid so those are the sort of the the mind flayer that is more powerful than any other mind flayer and will eventually become an elder brain the process of where they become an elder brain is really again awful because obviously <laughs> it doesn't it doesn't necessarily all oh, at the end of a mind flayer's life because why would they want to you know when they're at their most weakest uh, brain power wise now they'll they'll go go to the, the colony set it up and then they go right the time is right now for me to transition they have a staff like a metal a black metal staff with sentience with a huge claw on the back of it and all they do they just attach this claw thing to the back of their head and it just smacks their head apart and takes the brain and it gets implanted in the remains of the body and that eventually becomes the elder brain but i'm like you're carrying around a, a thing that's going to kill you death yeah oh it's, <laughs> it's it's horrendous and i i like the the approach the elder brains have to those things where they treat them almost like annoying children like yes. they don't want them around but they're not going to fight them because they know that they're essentially their retirement policy mm. but they know they're going to move out eventually it is it is a, like a, an adult <laughs> child relationship i think it's it's really really good. i hadn't thought of it like that that is amazing <laughs> just having like a, a, a like sort of like a comedy sort of like netflix thing and like oh thank god you're here adventurers fucking deal with my son like <laughs> <laughs> Like, I know I'm the big bad here, but <laughs> this guy's going to be the future big bad. Can you pick him off first? Yes, yes yeah. You know, I won't eat you first. <laughs> <laughs> 
I will let you live for as long as it takes you to kill this person. So, you know, take your time. Really take your time. <laughs> so there we go. That is Mind Flares for you. Next mm. time round, it's my go. Yes. The what? host. What are you, would you what like are you to know? I would love to know. What is it? <laughs> <laughs> she goes, oh no. <laughs> We're going to be having a look at the blood war. That's blood right. War. The endless war between devils and demons and Ooh. the way that the hell and abyss adds up, which I have said was one of the favorite things that I read in recent history. It was very, very good fun. Uh, in the meantime, you can find Fiona. Where can you be found, Fiona? Where, where are can you I be hiding found? these days? Where, where, well, currently in my home, but if I'm not <laughs> in quarantine, <laughs> in quarantine for us all. Um, but normally you can find me on Twitter. I run uh, the What Am I Rolling podcast, which is a, I do know this, a twice a monthly RPG one shot podcast. Uh, and you can find that on both Twitter and Instagram if you're one of those people at w-a-i-r underscore podcast and i also appear on a, a, a little unknown show that we keep name dropping but uh tbn mondays which i think ryan could tell you more about that <laughs> yes tbn mondays on youtube it's our it should be weekly D D stream it's it's, it's there or thereabouts but it depends on when i upload it but you can find me there as well i'm also on youtube in a different guise a much more gamey guys under us ryan if you want to come and have a look and find me there i should be on our social media channels but i'm not because i'm useless but one day fiona will impress the need of these things on me enough for me to actually go <laughs> off and do them there have been there, there are more fanciful ideas i think Agreed. it may happen you never know it's and fun. until then thank you very much for listening and see you next time oh thank you bye <laughs> bye, bye.